Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Emily Gilpin. I'm the Managing Director of the First Nations Forward Series, a National Observer Series dedicated to stories of success and self-determination in First Nations communities in so-called BC. Um, I've had a little bit of internet issues here in the town, so I'm actually sitting on my friend's porch right now. So please be patient. I think we should be fine connection-wise. But I'm very excited for today for our speaker, our guest speaker, Jessica. And if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Jessica Barudin and I'm Kwa Kwa Kwa. I'm a member of the Numgis First Nation. And um, so on my maternal side, we have ties to the Hutwapmis and the Kwa Gyoth and the Numgis. And on my paternal side, uh, my father was born in New York City and uh, with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a mother of two beautiful daughters, Maya Sequoia, Leela Starlight, and my husband, uh, Vince Dumoulin. And we live together in Alert Bay, British Columbia, so Northern Vancouver Island. And um, yeah, I spent the previous about nine years on the East Coast between New York City and uh, Montreal. And I complete there's Vince <laughs> painting a mural of, of me actually gathering our voices. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, yeah, so we lived over on the East Coast in Jojage um, in Montreal. And I spent some time in New York and um, did my master's at McGill University and spent some time working there, getting our family established. And we just recently moved home this past year or so. It's been uh, quite the whirlwind. <laughs> oh, wonderful, thank you so much. I've just been informed that I'm allowed to enter the house now. So I'm just gonna take myself off screen for a second and I'm going to be listening. But if you could please answer the question, when did you leave home and why did you leave home? And tell a little bit about your home. Where is home for you? Mm -hmm. So I left home, I think, shortly after my home for me. I, I'll start off by saying I was born and raised in Vancouver and um, I studied at UBC. And once I finished my undergraduate degree, I was um, really feeling the call to go home to Alert Bay. So that's where my, um, my mother was uh, born and raised and most of our family is there. So all my extended family where we spent a great deal of time growing up and uh, all my cousins and everyone. So um, I really felt like I needed to go home to Alert Bay and connect with my culture, uh, with my family, and to do some positive um, kind of wellness work there. So I had just finished a degree in human kinetics and thought I'd uh, try things out with personal training and. Um, group fitness and things like that just to get people moving and um, so I did that for a while and um, after about six to eight months or so I was feeling um, a little bit uh, like I needed some more guidance some more mentorship I was still quite young in my early 20s and um, had just been saving my money and, and had wanted to go to New York so I started looking for apartments and applying for jobs and um, I got a bunch of interviews <laughs> lined up and booked my ticket and went to New York City and wow. some friends there, some uh, my uncles there as well and um, just I love the city there and that time I was just adventurous, you know, no kids and uh, nothing, no commitments really. And uh, made the leap and started working there right away in, in Tribeca at uh, a gym there. And um, I had already applied to grad school, so I was sort of in between and sort of um, biding my time until, you know, hoping that I was going to get accepted into the, the programs that I applied for. And um, yeah, just worked, learned how to hustle in New York City, and that was that was kind of crazy. Um, and then I got accepted to McGill University and um, um, Queens as well. So I made a decision to go to study at McGill because I was familiar with Montreal 
and I had several friends of mine who were also starting programs at uh, McGill and Concordia. So uh, it made sense to have that support and yeah, started school. That's so exciting. I mean, it's not every day that you hear about somebody that goes from a small village, you know, coastal village to New York City and making a huge change like that. So I'm wondering, like, when you were living in, the, in New York City and Montreal those first few years, what were some of the biggest differences, the biggest culture shocks for you? What did you miss the most about home um, or what did you learn about yourself and your you know, childhood and where you were born and raised that you didn't really realize until you took a step out? Yeah, it was definitely a huge culture shock going from Alert Bay where there's literally a population of about a thousand, maybe 1200 in sort of like the busier times um, of the year and kind of knowing everyone and having that familiarity. Like that's what I love about Alert Bay is you drive around and you literally wave at everyone when you're driving and talk to everyone and um, so going to New York City I was um, familiar already because I spent quite a bit of time there um, just visiting friends and um, but I was getting lost on the subway I was you know sort of just in awe and the vibration of the city and there's you know, millions of people uh, who live there and um, who travel there every year so um, it was overwhelming. I'd say I learned a lot. I had a really great mentor, uh, Lucky Herman, who uh, I met at uh, Equinox where, where I worked and he really um, looked out for me and, and was very supportive and, and the team there. There's a lot of people I still keep in touch with who, who we worked with and just um, a different culture. And what was, I think, unique was that I was different in their eyes like I was you know the Canadian girl and you know also learning that I was First Nations I kind of thought that was that was different you know they call me Native American um, you know and making that sort of connection and so um, in a way it it, it helped me in, in uh, developing my business skills and my clientele because I was a little bit different and, and unique in a way <laughs> being there so yeah it was cool Right. Well, before, you know, we really want to talk today about what you're up to now, this PhD program that you've started, movement as medicine. You know, I really want to get into that. You, a lot of what you post is around healing, um, healing intergenerational trauma, healing for the well-being of future generations. So I really want to get into that. But before we do, can you give everyone an update right now what's going on at home and how COVID has affected your home and community um, and anything that you, you want folks to know at this time? Yeah, so um, obviously COVID's affected everyone. Um, we're all living this, this strange uh, reality. Um, and in particular, our village was hit pretty hard. Um, in Alert Bay, which is also referred to as Cormorant Island, um, we had a cluster outbreak recently, um, the past uh, couple months, uh, so it's been it's been pretty chaotic for um, our little community here. Um, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of uncertainty, and um, yeah, I think that we're kind of coming up for a breath of air right now. People are feeling um, still anxious, but um, well, I know I am um, at times, but. Uh, yeah, there was um, just about, I think, 30 confirmed cases here. And uh, right now I'm working with the First Nations Health Authority. So um, working very closely with health directors, chiefs, and, and our leadership in the Kwakwakwak family and getting regular updates from our medical health officers and our um, uh, from both Island Health and First Nations Health Authority. So um, just hearing, you know, we're kind of on the downslope of the first wave and we haven't had um, any cases. I believe the last confirmed case was April 28th. And so what they've said, um, the health officers have said that we've now passed about um, two incubation periods, so two two week intervals of uh, being COVID free, which is very positive. There hasn't been any other confirmed COVID cases and they've really ramped up testing um, so I'm hoping that people are starting to feel a bit more 
secure that um, people really got down to work here. We had a phenomenal response from our nation, um, from our emergency operations uh, center here, the Village of Alert Bay, the Wheatlala Band Area Council, and our own Namdis Nation. Um, it's really great work that was done and all the supporting agencies. So um, they, it could have been a few hundred cases and, uh, and they, they really put a stop to it very quickly, restricted a lot of uh, any transmission. So, um, you know, we had to deal with tsunami sirens and um, curfew, and uh, it was very strange. It was very weird here for a little while, but I'm, I'm glad we're a bit out of the woods. Um, unfortunately, we did have, um, we did lose a community member. So um, one of our um, elders here, a beloved woman, and um, that was, you know, really publicized um, in a way in the media or was highlighted, I should say, not publicized um, around that loss because um, losing her was uh, the first death of a First Nations person in community. So when that happened, I think everyone was just totally deflated and, um, you know, just not even being able to hug each other and, and be close and grieve was just very heavy so I think people are just sort of still reeling and still um, processing everything that just happened and still a little bit worried about potentially you know things coming back and hitting hitting again so just hoping to keep some optimism in, in crazy times thank you for sharing and I'm so sorry to hear about that loss for community um, I've had the opportunity to visit your home territories twice and they're very beautiful, very beautiful. And I know um, from the, the folks that I've met, very strong community. So I think it's a testament, you know, to people coming together in these times as well. Um, just moving along a little bit, can you tell me what you were up to when you were in Deodiage, when you were in Montreal, Kanagahaga territories? What sorts of things did you get involved in and how did you maintain your relationship to exercise and yoga and how did that continue to be a part of your life? Yeah, so I mentioned I, I went to start my studies. Uh, I did my master's in physical therapy at McGill and um, right away I, I became connected with the uh, McGill First Nations community. Uh, they have a First Peoples House there, so I connected with um, my now um, one of my closest friends, Paige Isaac, who was, um, you know, leading the the programs there, and um, she she really, you know, just embraced me, and I, I let her know that I wanted to get involved, and um, just sort of keen because that when when you're so far from home and kind of creating those communities, um, that was just something that I felt really. Um, like I wanted to do something and have some opportunities to connect with the the other First Nations people, um, other Indigenous people uh, in that area, and in those sort of same circumstances. So um, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, a very defining time in my life. I find um, I was in my program and it was very intense. It was very challenging. And sort of um, quickly, I, I felt that it wasn't the right fit for me and that I had sort of wavered in, in wanting to pursue a career in rehabilitation. And, and my heart was really being drawn into indigenous health and indigenous ways of knowing and sort of resistance because at that same time was when Idle No More was really popping up. So I was really drawn into the whole sort of Twitter and social media um, a frenzy that was happening with Idle No More instead of some of my class stuff. and. Um, yeah, just had some job opportunities with um, working with youth. Uh, we helped to um, just continue launching the, uh, a really great camp that I love called the Eagle Spirit Camp. And um, uh, yeah, I, I basically, I had my daughter halfway through um, the completion of that program. So my first child, that's Maya Sequoia. She's now six years old. And um, yeah, I had her, I became pregnant with her when I was 25 and had her when I was 26 and um, had to take a leave from the program. And um, I was a little bit, um, you know, beside myself because they weren't very supportive of having a pregnant student. And um, at that point, there really wasn't a whole lot of support for First Nation students. 
Um, and uh, I was on my own. Vince and I were really having to, we struggled pretty hard in those, in that first, you know, couple of years of her being alive and still maintained, you know, uh, like family life. And um, we had a lot of support from his family and um, our, our community there. Uh, but it was it was really hard being away from home and, and sort of, um, you know, unsure of what was going to happen. So, um, yeah, there's there's a whole sort of backstory. I'm not sure how much in depth you want, to, want me to go into that. But that really <laughs> that that pregnancy and that um, sort of uh, experience shaped a lot and our direction of um, mm -hmm. our priorities and everything. Mm. And sort of the next steps of two of, of not... Uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned with school and fi finishing that and moving into more of uh, a focus with Indigenous health rather than mm -hmm. uh, pursuing, you know, a career as a physiotherapist and, and everything. So mm -hmm. things really changed for me at that time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a great learning experience. Before you had your first daughter, before you were a mother, a life giver, um, did you know that you wanted to work in this area of, of birth work? Because you're now a doula and we'll talk more about that later, but did, was that experience and then being, you know, and then having a second daughter, were those the experiences that were like, this is the field I want to work in? And was there something about your actual lived experience that really, I didn't realize that this was a part of the process or I want to be a part of making this experience how I wanted for, for myself as a mother, for other life givers, or can you talk a little bit about what drew you to that work? Hmm. Well, I don't think I was at that point, so like before becoming a mother, um, so drawn to birth work and, and that mm -hmm. I was still feeling, you know, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do on myself. And mm -hmm. uh, I was always drawn to um, working with my community. I, it was always my goal since I was, you know, a teenager, wanting to mm -hmm. go home and, and sort of work in community and work with my people um, mm -hmm. and work with other Native people. Um, so that was sort of um, my, always what I wanted to do, even if it was in rehab, I was going to be in an, an Indigenous community. Um, but birth work and all of that didn't really start for me until you know, um, having my own children, um, I was mm -hmm. able to be a part of one of my best friends, uh, her, her daughter, I was there for her birth. So um, supporting her through that when we were uh, 19. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was sort of my first, you know, connection to, to young motherhood. And mm -hmm. uh, just seeing her witnessing her give birth to her daughter and having such a close connection with their child. Um, I always felt connected to, um, to that process. Um, but I think for me, I was drawn to working with Indigenous youth and in Indigenous mm -hmm. communities um, until I became a mother and it became more apparent that I wanted to work with women and with girls and women across the lifespan, not just in the life-giving stages, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have women been a big part of your life? <laughs> Yeah, and I add this photo because I, you know, I did a little bit of creeping and research as I always do, and I noticed that you often uphold the matriarchs, aunties, sisters uh, in your life. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so that's my grandmother, my mother, uh, my auntie, and my sister, and um, my daughter and my niece. So this photo was taken by one of our close friends, Chris Krug, at our wedding. Um, we got married on Euclid Beach in Euclid Territory. Um, and it was such a special moment for Vince and I and for our whole family. It was a very intimate wedding ceremony and how we integrated different elements of our own spirituality and our spiritual path. Uh, we had just come from Sundance ceremony. So it was um, a really open time for us. And my mom, actually, she looks very happy and beaming here, um, but she was very ill with um, stage four uh, cancer. So um, these women in my life have been so key to who I am, obviously my own life givers, my, my mother and uh, my granny, uh, Laura, Laura Cook, and uh, my Aunt Irene, who's my sister, my, um, mother's youngest sister and she's been really um just such a great role model and inspiration for my sister and I since we were little girls 
and uh, I always look up to my my on my own family and the other um, anti types that we have in our life and my sister Raven um, also another amazing support for me and uh, just inspiration she's such a beautiful person and we were pregnant with our daughters at the same time so I think that was sort of the the catalyst too for birth work and women working with uh, with moms and everything so she was uh, we had that experience together as sisters which was really beautiful and, and uh, yeah just really special for us and bonded our, our girls our girls are best friends so it's and they're a little like Indian sisters so it's fun yeah that's beautiful is it just the two of you you and your sister we have two half brothers um, Sam and Jason oh yeah dad side but okay we're, um, from my mom yeah it's just my sister and I Ah, uh, wonderful. I'm just wondering because I have one sister and we're very close. Uh, and we often talk about how our kinship and our relationship has really defined how we are in relation with others. And that being like our really core, you know, when I opened my eyes into the world, it was her face that I saw. It was, you know, she who carried me and, and played with me and um, who I learned how to communicate and fight with and overcome challenges and so I know sisterhood is like, it can be, it's different for everyone, but it can be a very sacred and special bond. And then you having two young girls yourself, having sisters as well. And that, that kinship runs in your family as well. For sure. And, and, for sure. Our, and my daughters have about the same age difference as Raven and I. So um, we do have that, you know, very sacred connection. And uh, mm-hmm. she's my you know, my support, like we, we've been through so much together with, you know, having a, a kind of a crazy childhood in, in um, you know, different times, um, growing up uh, with two parents who struggled with, uh, you know, different challenges with substance use and, and other factors growing up in poverty and, and things like that. So we have a really deep uh, respect for one another mm. and connection and she just is so positive and encouraging, so grateful. And she's actually my daughter's teacher this year since we moved. So she we came back. She moved back from China with her husband and her daughter. Oh, she wow. Was pregnant. And they had their second baby. Uh, and I got to be there uh, and connect her with the, the doula who did our training um, for our doula training in the North Island. And so um, she had that connection with that um, Miranda Kelly from the Equatorial Collective. And um, yeah, she had her baby in hospital. And I got to be there the day she was born and um, just hold her and connect with my sister. And, you know, just that whole process it really, you know, us coming home was, you know, we're just always on the phone, like, okay, how, are you going to do it? Or are you going to go home? Or like, wow. what you like, you know, we didn't have, we both had to kind of like make big decisions. And we, 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 like our families had big decisions of, okay, what's, what's on the horizon for our career? What's, what are we going to do? Cause it's hard when you take in care of mm-hmm. young families and moving. And so they were kind of, they were in China for two years teaching and decided to come home because of, mm-hmm. of the pregnancy. And, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, us too, we had a, a really, you know, wanting to come home for many years, but to actually make it happen was, was, um, relied on a lot of uh, hope and a prayer and a lot of hard work so Mm, well it sounds like you have strong prayers I mean the first time I ever met you and your partner your husband was in ceremony with um, Delbert who's been commenting on here which is wonderful and I have a photo we can bring up just to really hold our hands up to them do you want to speak a little bit about your relationship with this (laughs) with this couple here and, and what that was like yeah, so Jean Stevenson, uh, Muskego Cree, and Delbert Sampson Chushwa, uh, First Nation, they're two elders who really um, mean so much to Vince and I, um, just beautiful people, and I know you know them well as well, mm-hmm. um, and people in Montreal who have the opportunity to to know them, um, just they, they did so much for us. Um, oh, I feel emotional. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, they really helped us out when uh, we went through a tremendous uh, period of grief and loss. Um, Vince's mother, um, unfortunately, she was killed uh, a few years ago. And Mm -hmm. um, because of them um, and their love, they really helped us to 
you know, to we had sort of decisions to make in a, in a way like we could have gone down a pretty dark path, which I think would have kind of separated our family. Um, but they brought us towards like a ceremonial community and um, a way of life that's just so um, that brought so much meaning and hope and um, connection in our life that we were just uh, really needing after such uh, such devastation. So uh, so grateful for these two and um, yeah, I really love them. Jean was actually there for my the birth of my second daughter, Leela Starlight. She mm -hmm. came and she was um, present. She, she came at like two or three in the morning to um, the birthing home. Uh, I had my midwife and, and Vince present. And um, yeah, Jean was, Jean was there. She brought her drum and, uh, you know, her sense mm -hmm. of humor and her antibiotics <laughs> and uh, her good medicine and prayers. And um, went. it was a beautiful birth. Uh, there was one sort of moment that got a little bit scary. Um, mm. We all held, we were laying on the bed and, you know, my baby's heart was decelerating and the midwife was like, okay, you got to turn around, you got to get you out of this position and get on your back. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, moved as quickly as I could with my big belly onto my back and then we just held hands and I said, let's pray. And then so we're just holding their hands and um, just praying and we're all just, you know, praying that she's okay and um, her heart really um, just picked right back up and contractions carried on and yeah so that was you know she was another influence around birth work and um being a good relative and taking care of people and um mm. yeah and, I, and because of them we met our our family in chippewa of the thames um and uh their best friends uh penny penny french and andre half day who are now our, our spirit parents um we we connected with them because of Jean and Albert, so yeah. Mm. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your PhD? What yeah. that work involves, yeah. and you know, are you enjoying it? Do you love it? What what what's happening with the PhD? Yeah, um, it was a big decision again. So last year, or well, over a year ago, we had kind of had a lot of big decisions to make. I had already applied to a program because I'd been thinking about um, taking some next steps with my education for some time. And um, being in Concord, um, being in sort of the Montreal area, there's a few different options. And at that point, we're still thinking, okay, we're gonna be in Montreal for a while longer and let's see mm -hmm. how we can make this work and how we can continue to build professionally and, um, spiritually and and all of that you know um mm -hmm. as a family and individually as well so um i was very fortunate to have a good relationship with um, a metis scholar elizabeth fast uh, who is a professor at concordia and she's awesome she's amazing. <laughs> yeah she's yeah. just an awesome woman and she's like an even awesome more like the best supervisor you could ask for uh, because mm -hmm. she really nourishes her students in a way that's um, supportive, but got, like just guiding people very, you know, gracefully. So um, she was very supportive in, in me getting my application together and um, helping to establish um, a supervisory committee. So I also have mm -hmm. um, someone named Jason Lewis who works at Concordia mm -hmm. on my um, another another awesome person. Yeah, and um, and. Because of um, those two, I, I said, well, I, I'd really love to have an elder on my committee. And um, so I had connected with just knowing um, Gudgie Cook um, uh, Mohawk from Memphis Destiny. She's a midwife. She's just an all around amazing human. Um, she's a sort of an indigenous scholar and um, activist in her own right. She's um, done tremendous work um, for her own people, um, but for advancing midwifery and birth work across, you know, Canada. And, um, you know, so I had um, met her in ceremony and built a relationship with her. She's um, the auntie of one of our close friends. And I had asked her to, to also join the committee and uh, she did, and it was actually, this is the first arrangement that Concordia has made to have an elder. So they had to 
rewrite some of the policies uh, to ensure that there was, um, you know, support and, 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 and the appropriate environment to have um, an elder involved who is not, you know, a Concordia faculty member. Um, and I had other um, support from other um, scholars in, in my network who helped me, you know, write applications for funding and to just get in. So um, Hibbe Zafran, who I worked with at uh, McGill, um, has also helped me along the way. And basically, it's an individualized program at Concordia University. Um, and what that means is that it's research creation and sort of outside the box type of research. So something that doesn't just fit in a discipline. And that's what I, I knew I wanted to do something involving Indigenous health, um, Indigenous traditional ways uh, and values, and uh, you know working with women and youth, and also um, something in integrating yoga um, and meditation and embodied practices. And I was just sort of I remember sitting, sitting with Liz, get, getting ideas for my own practice and or sorry my application, and I was like, can I really? do this? Can I actually like just pull all these things together that I love to craft this sort of, you know, scholarship type of program? And she was like, yeah, you can. And I was just amazed thinking like, wow, times have really changed. And I really love that, you know, things have been advancing, especially for Indigenous scholarship and um, research and, and how we're integrating our own, you know, our own Indigenous science and knowledge. Um, so what I'm embarking on, I just finished my first year of coursework. So that was, uh, went pretty well considering I'm working Congratulations. full time. <laughs> Thanks. Working <laughs> full time and, um, you know, momming full time and we were still looking for a house as of uh, recently. So just all these crazy things um, and able to finish that first year of coursework, which went really well. And um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the, the research can really highlight um, reconnecting women and girls, um, First Nations women and girls, um, but the context will be Kwa 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 women and girls and mm -hmm. Two-Spirit uh, youth. And um, looking at ways to connect with women's teachings through embodied practices like yoga and meditation mm -hmm. and our own, you know, traditional um, ways of, of connecting with our, our bodies and, and healing. So developing sort of a, with the, the women and girls, like a healing strategy uh, that works in the community. So um, that's sort of like the broad strokes. And I think it's going to go uh, many different directions as, as, um, time moves forward and dynamics and relationships are established and nurtured. So I'm really excited. I'm excited too. That'll be exciting. Do you know? Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about that in your experience? How, how do those things connect? How do your teachings and your culture connect to your experience with movement? And what does movement as medicine or movement and yoga as healing, what does that mean to you? What does that feel like? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's those are the big questions that I've been asking myself and sort of um, getting a bit out of my head and trying to do my own practice. And, you know, it all ties to our who we are as Bakwams, as, you know, as Ongwe Hongwe, as Indigenous people, we have um, connection to uh, the land and connection to the elements and um, being active in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, how we live traditionally and how we're revitalizing these, these ways of connecting with, you know, our food systems and um, just reclaiming that um, is really crucial. So, you know, yoga for me is a part of it that obviously isn't from our culture, from our lineage. It comes from, you know, Southeast Asia, from India, and it has very deep historic roots. Um, but for us, yeah, that's at um, Chief Bill Kramer's potlatch. So for us, our, our way is in the big house, in the Gutsi, in our potlatch way, and um, our dancing and our um, movement and all of the, the prep that goes into these ceremonies, it's, you know, requires um, uh, being embodied and also being very connected to the spiritual realm. So in a way, how I see it, 
and in my own um, practice and experience is that there are so many ways that yoga, yogic philosophy and values are aligned with indigenous spirituality and indigenous values is that it's very earth-based and it's also a spiritual practice. So who we are is um, we're spiritual beings and um, and we've always been connected to that. You know, we've had a lot of um, historic and intergenerational trauma that's impacted our our connection to to our ceremonies and who we are um, in our ways. And, and this was from a, a trip of my husband going on with my crazy uncles. They were going climbing, <laughs> and so that you know, you know, harvesting foods. You have to be mobile. You have to be flexible. Like clam digging is very arduous in the back and. Um, just different things and taking care of children and a lot mm -hmm. of walking and being being busy. This is my uncle John Mako's smokehouse, preparing some fish here, um, which, you know, it's a lot of work that my husband's been involved with since he's been, you know, moved from Montreal. So I'm very grateful for all the, the people in my life, uh, my uncles and my husband who, who are part of that. Um, you know, food process of maintaining that connection to um, the land and, and our, our food. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I see that just being connected and, and also for me is just working on um, developing emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally and physically and mo uh, sort of modeling that for my children, uh, my little girls. They're um, they really absorb everything that we do. And, um, you know, for them to have that as part of their life, it's so important to to make that accessible, that they're out in the forest with us, that they're out, you know, um, gardening with us and um, mm -hmm. being familiar with different um, plant and animal life and all of our foods and, and moving. So they love to, to exercise with us and to walk and, um, yeah, I just want to keep that throughout throughout their lives. Mm. And I mentioned before, a lot of your posts, a lot of your work, even a lot of these conversations, you talk a lot about healing, a lot about healing. And these healing, I think, means different things for different people. It can have different cultural roots and contexts. But colonization, we know, is not a thing in the past. It's something that Indigenous peoples deal with today, ongoing you know, institutional, systemic inequities, racism, right? There's a lot of things that have been, that, that are embodied in, in this presence of Canada as a being and the many different faces and arms and branches that Canada has. But healing is so important for Indigenous peoples. So what does healing mean and look like to you? Um, and in what ways do you see healing possible? What what excites you about the ways that Indigenous people are healing or how does healing have an impact in your life as well? Yeah, um, that's such a beautiful question. And um, it is very um, sacred and um, personal for every um, individual. And uh, it comes it brings to mind um, something that one of our elders, Joe Johnson, um, shared is that we don't know what healing looks like. You know, we don't, we can't really identify it. It's something that we feel. And, um, and it can mean so many different things um, and work on so many different layers and, and subtly it can happen in our dreams. Um, and through our dreams, it can happen through ceremony, um, through therapy, through, uh, you know, um, our own connection to movement. Uh, so for me, um, my own healing journey has, um, you know, really started, I think, when Vince and I got together, because he kind of introduced me to um, a different lens of looking at spirituality um, and exposed me to just some some different thinkers. And um, so that really s sort of changed things in my mind, because, you know, he's an artist and um, he looks at things a lot differently than than I was at that time, and that even to this day, you know, he's got a different perspective, and um, and so he really opened my eyes to, to seeing things differently, and that's what I love, and that's what's really kept our marriage, um, you know, developing and, and growing. Um, but after that, I think um, my my um, 
my children um, have been a big part of my healing and my healing journey. And um, we've we've endured, um, you know, some loss. Like I've said, the loss of um, my husband's mother and as well um, my mother. So that grief and that that pain and despair and everything has been um, just connected us to that's that's life. That's the richness of life. That's the rawness, and that's the heartbreak. And um, and because of that, we were, you know, very fortunate to be in this era. Um, you talked about different factors of, uh, you know, colonialism and everything. That's still uh, very much present uh, systemically and even interpersonally. Unfortunately, um, and for Indigenous people, we still face a lot of discrimination and. Um, challenges and um, many barriers uh, but you know luckily we, we're in a time where we have um, a boom and a revitalization in in our spirituality and our and in, in our ceremonies and um, the best thing that came from our experience out east really was um, connecting to different ceremonial circles um, so Sundance for me um, again, that's not part of our Kwapakwap ways, but uh, we were initiated as sun dancers in uh, Anishinaabe um, Sun Dance Lodge uh, in Chippewa of the Thames. And this would have been our fourth year. Unfortunately, it's been canceled because of everything with the pandemic. So, you know, that's very challenging. But um, mm -hmm. that whole journey and that whole commitment and that sacrifice and um, some of that is part of my healing and and um it's it's so subtle it's so and, and then it's so powerful all at the same time like in those in that sort of you know those four days of um the ceremony and even the days before and after it, it's very um there's things that just happen that you can't describe really that you can't um, words fall short of just waking up with the sun and praying to the sun and acknowledging the power and um, you know connecting your feet to the earth and dancing and listening to the heartbeat of the drum and smelling the beautiful medicines the cedar and the sage and um, being present with men and women and children and elders and um, you know this the sacred bond the sacredness of you know the tree of life and all of the teachings that come with these beautiful ceremonies, um, it's, it's hard to put in words, but I think that it's that's life. That's our way of life. And um, it's how you live every day. This is sure everyone can go to these ceremonies and probably come out of it unscathed or alive, but um, they are challenging and it requires you to sacrifice your comforts. And I think that's sort of um, what we've been reflecting on about this pandemic is like, most people aren't used to sacrifice and sacrificing um, what we've right. been accustomed to uh, in this world. Um, and so, you know, Sundance sort of and fasting and, and other ceremonies, you know, you have to sit with that discomfort. Same with birth, that pain, that discomfort, those sensations, you have to sit with it and you have to breathe. And so for me, healing um, is a lot of that, um, just finding, um, a, a sense of centeredness and um, connection and just breathing and just sort of working through it and and praying and so um, you know it's a it's a it's a it's a long journey but it's worthwhile when you commit to your own healing and um, and uh, you know and I think there's a lot of other ways to to heal outside of our own indig indigenous ways and and I, and I promote that as well. And I think if people can heal from running, if they can heal from, um, you know, exercising or, or writing or, or different things where they can connect to themselves, being authentic in who they are and um, expressing themselves and connecting with something greater or deeper, um, I find that that's healing. It could be, you know, prayers and um, it could be so many different things. and even healing through ceremony uh, or through um, therapy. You know, I, I promote that for taking care of your mental health. So, yeah. And this is a quote that I took from your Instagram. Um, the soul usually knows what to do to heal itself. The challenge is to silence the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what does that mean for you? 
that sort of just le- like it's just letting go of of those those thoughts, those thinking forward and and thinking about things that we can't control. And um, I think that's really part of what you know my own healing in Sundance and in ceremony is just um, sitting with yourself and um, being present and um, experiencing the emotions and um, you know connecting with the elements and that's that's a big part of it and you know I think about another elder that um, we love and, and um, have learned so much from Tom Cook from Wazasne and his wife Loretta Afraid of Bear, who's Lakota Sioux. And, um, you know, he talked about different things, different elements of that are, you know, sort of metaphors for life as well. But how cer- a ceremony is really, um, there's, there's the goal is sort of coming to this vortex, this sort of these vortices of healing and connection. Um, and then it goes to chaos and sort of it goes, it sort of moves back and forth and into this chaos and then coming t- together. And so it's sort of uh, this, this dance and that's what I find um, healing is. That's what I find my wellness journey is. Sometimes we're in balance and sometimes we might feel like we're in chaos and um, both are, both are fine and just sort of accepting it and um, moving through it and feeling it. And um, yeah, I see Delbert's comments, you know, connecting with the, the different elements, the instruments, the, uh, you know, um, music and song and um, mm. all of that, our medicines. And looks like you're experiencing the internet problems. I thought I would be the one with <laughs> internet challenges here. I'm back. Am I back? Yes, I You're think back. so. Yes. Oh, the back. internet, the, the, the village town here is having some general internet issues, so it's kind of coming in and out, but thank you for sharing that. I heard you and I hear you. <laughs> and I think when I do hear you and when I, when I have these conversations around healing, it makes me feel really good, you know, just even the words medicines, even you just bringing in cedar and reimagining cedar and talking about sage and tobacco and talking about our traditions and ways and such strong teachings. Like the thing that I think about often is that, you know, obviously indigenous cultures are very different, but people, we are very, we have very strong teachings, very strong ceremonies, very strong you know, millennial old cultures and relationships to medicines. But a lot of the time, there's so many barriers that are standing in the way for people being able to access uh, the land, even, you know, this whole thing, land back is it's like, it's deep, it's multi-layered, you know, land back is like life back, you know? So I'm wondering, what do you think are some of the biggest obstacles that indigenous peoples face from being able to access all of the things that you mentioned and being able to really engage in that healing process. Yeah, and that's such a good point because, you know, we can't take for granted that it's just, we can we can get there because it takes a lot. Um, it's not as accessible as it was before, you know, we developed these big urban areas. And for myself, I spent the majority of my life living in um, more of an urban area and, uh, you know, just growing up in cities and it feels like you're very um, disconnected and you're very withdrawn from that sacredness and that's how those cities and places and institutions are designed um, mm-hmm. for us as indigenous people to connect to that it, it, it can be very uh, daunting it can be um, um, triggering it can be so many things and, and sort of uh, this movement and re, re- uh, reclaiming land and territory and um, connection to these these uh, places in, in our territories and um, the oceans and just protecting mm-hmm. that um, is so critical and I really want to you know just acknowledge all the people who are on the front lines and fighting for that and mm-hmm. uh, it's just incredible um, 
and important work um, for people who are in those situations where they're feeling like they're not connected. Um, I think the first way, you know, for me in an urban area was um, a talking circle and I was able to um, connect with elders, you know, um, connect with, mm-hmm. that's where I met Jean and Delbert and mm-hmm. um, having, step having things that are um you know like a humble perspective you can have a glass of water and you can pray to that water uh, you know you can have mm-hmm. um your own medicines on you if, you if it's tobacco that's something that's sacred to you it's it's developing relationships with those medicines that, that takes time um but once mm-hmm. you start doing that it, it's very you know that's it's all it takes is just sort of mm-hmm. an openness and you don't have to be an expert like i'm not um, I have different uh, instruments that, that we've been gifted and that we've, you know, traded and, and um, um, purchased. So like hand drums and like, it's just connecting with that, that, um, you know, that connecting with the spirit of that instrument, for instance. So mm-hmm. the hand drum, just acknowledging the, the, the wood that's involved with making that, the, the mm-hmm. animal um, that's been sacrificed to, to make that and all the intentions, um, you know, the different, you know, shakers and gourds and the different stories behind it is just connecting with it and learning about um, songs and that's something that I'm I'm, I'm you know still um, learning I'm still uh, you know trying to, to pick up different songs and, and our language and I'm, and what's beautiful is I get to learn with my daughter um, she's in mm-hmm. school she's in the police regular school where they have a phenomenal cultural program and mm-hmm. um, and they do a lot of language and um, dancing. And right now, because of COVID, everything's online. So they're sharing mm-hmm. so much content, so many beautiful songs and mm-hmm. teachings and legends. And, and so um, we're very lucky that we have the cultural leads that we do. Um, but because of you know where we're at, there's so many ways to connect with um, our own cultures because of this mm-hmm. sort of online experience and social media. Um, but it's also, you know, I just encourage people to have um, just developing that relationship personally, whether they're putting their feet in water or they're, you know, walking on the earth or, you know, amongst mm-hmm. trees or whatever it is that, that's sacred mm-hmm. to you. Um, it's, it doesn't have to be so um, challenging in our, in our own minds. We can keep it humble and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, even giving thanks for food or giving thanks um, one of my favorite things um, that I should practice more regularly is, is just waking up in the morning. And um, what I love is to sort of look out into um, towards where the sun's uh, coming up and to, to just take some deep breaths. Like I try to take 10 deep breaths um, before even aligning with um, prayer or anything is just connecting with your own breath. That's a ceremony. And mm-hmm. that's you know, very simple. And it's, very sacred and from there you know it's just continuing that um that practice that's very strong i like connecting with your own breath that ceremony i think that's really powerful thank you it reminds me of um i was in a fast a couple summers ago and i was talking to someone kind of coming out of the fast like having anxiety around going back to the city going back to vancouver you know, being a visitor in those territories, but feeling like what you were mentioning, feeling very trapped up by buildings and, you know, just there being so many barriers to me being able to connect. And my friend said at that time, you know, cement is also earth, right? You're like, you know, cement is, is also from the earth. And, um, you know, it just really expanded my my idea of I can only be in a, a sacred space internally if I'm in nature or if I'm in a sacred space. I also had an ex who had, you know, said that we always talk about, oh, it's a sacred site or a sacred space, but every space really is sacred, right? Because every space has spirit. And if you're occupying that space, your spirit is in that space too. So it just really unfolded the way that I thought about these things. But before we continue, looks like community members are demanding that you sing a song. (laughs) <laughs> I think it seems to be your husband that started it off. Sing a song. 
And then we have sing a song, sing a song, sing a song. So you were talking about learning a song. You were talking about song as medicine. So I would love if you're comfortable. I'm going to take myself off the screen. You haven't lost me to the internet here, but if you would like to share a song and if you could share a little bit about what that song means or what it is, who who wrote the song, where you learned the song. Oh, boy. You guys are mean, <laughs> mean relatives. I, I know the ones who are egging it on, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to touch on before that. Before sure. That um, I, I think it's so true what you said about um, that sort of city experience too. It's it's all it's all processed materials that come from the earth and right. um, man made, and so having that sort of um, deeper or broader perspective, but also mm -hmm. you know connecting connecting with your your own way of protecting yourself spiritually. So I think that's also important that we we make sure that we're we protect ourselves and our spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so it is. Uh, it's a um, it's a challenging time in, in mm -hmm. urban areas to do that sometimes, and mm -hmm. especially with a lot of the context and some of the heaviness. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know what song to sing. It's so much pressure. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know if I can do it. I didn't, I didn't think <laughs> you don't have to do it <laughs> by no means you don't have to do it i just it's like that i saw the request coming yeah. in it's like that scene in Step Brothers where he's like i'm getting sick and my throat's <laughs> sore I'm like no, i'm tired i didn't sleep well <laughs> so yes just, just that's not a problem we, of the book but sometime i think i'll i'll feel up for it and sure yeah. sure and if anything comes you know if you feel like it at any point feel free um, and Delbert saying here anyways to your husband, maybe Vince should sing a song. So maybe Vince <laughs> should head over to the office and pop on screen and he can sing a song. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just kind of weird because I'm in the hospital here in Cornwall right. Island Health Center and it's very sterile and it's not feeling very... Uh, it's inspired. a place that's begging for song, Jessica. Yeah. It's begging for music is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My sister happens to have more pressure coming in, but my sister happens to have an amazing voice. And I'm biased, right? Because I grew up with this voice. This voice is like the narration of my life story. But I love her singing voice. She is very, her music is medicine. And so our whole life, I would demand that she would sing because I was convinced that any space that she sang in it was transformed. It was just better. You know, it was just touched and that that her voice and the songs that she carries are so powerful and such good medicine that we would literally be on like a subway or a bus and I would be like, you have to sing, sing for the people, you know, just sing and touch people with your voice and your medicine. So uh, what I'm trying, I'm not trying to pressure you, although the pressure is coming in, literally just the words, the pressure. <laughs> but I think anyone in the space that you're in and the sterile environment, that's how we transform sometimes, hey, is with that with that song and even as I'm talking I'm thinking of so many places that I've been that have been so colonial so dry so um tense and heavy and where there's been song or ceremony or dance or regalia or indigenous presence and spirit and how the the power of that how those spaces can be transformed um it reminds me of when I actually I went to the women's march in Washington after Trump was elected uh the president of the United States and I went with a group of uh Ganegehaga Mohawk women from Akwesasne and I remember it was a really powerful time actually we were sitting on the subway and the subway was full of protesters people with like vaginas on their heads and all of these you know all of these women upset with uh, the fact that Trump was that we had this predator and racist person that was the president of the United States and um, my friends, my sisters, they started singing their water song on the mm. subway. And um, their water song is like from Akwesasne. The, yeah, I've heard it. Is, yes, it's so beautiful. Like, it's so moving. And it was just such a, yeah, it was a very powerful moment just seeing how they transformed the environment. Everyone, you know, there was this energy of protest, right? Protest and um, and then just having this music and this medicine and this water medicine come into that space. It was very powerful. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll sing a little bit of a song because it just reminded me of um, just my experience in Montreal. We had a women's uh, hand drum group that we started with the First People's House and 
Uh, we had different people like Vicky Boldo, who's now the, one of the elders at Concordia University, um, who mm-hmm. shared a song with us, and, uh, you know, Mo Clark, and um, different Dana Danger, all the different people in, in that sort of Montreal scene. We had this women's yes. group that would come together um, sort of weekly or bi-weekly, and... Um, yeah, so Vicky shared the song, the Wildflower song um, that I love um, and that's coming to me now um, mm-hmm. more than any other song. So, um, yeah. Could you, like, put up an image or something so I don't have to, like... <laughs> Absolutely, I'll put up an image for you, no problem. And if it's, if it's the song I'm thinking of, I might know it, so I might join you. Wildflower? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, join me, please. <laughs> okay, I'll put up... Hold on, let me put, what what image? Did you see any images that you liked? What about this one? Is this okay? Yeah, that one's good. Okay, great. Notice how I put in the backdrop the salmon. Yeah. <laughs> I've been playing it. around with photos. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're ready for you whenever you are. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey. Hey, 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 back on my end so <laughs> yes. <I'm> sorry <laughs> tire it was beautiful no belt it out yeah start singing a little bit i love that song i mean i love the idea of wildflowers i love that wildflowers burst through concrete uh-huh. right like that's so powerful um uh, yeah, and wildflowers burst, burst through concrete. Like I, I thought about that a lot when I was living in Vancouver. I was living in the downtown east side at Squatch Ice Artists and Residency Building. And um, yeah, I thought a lot about how life exists everywhere. Life is so resilient. You know, this life force is so resilient. We are so resilient. Um, so yeah, and it looks like your daughter was singing along, sang along with her mom, which is beautiful. And you've also just blessed the hospital. So lots of good feedback coming in. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that song. Yeah, Music is medicine. As a nurse, she's was a nurse here. She is a nurse. She's from here. She's a, a relative of mine. So yo, mm-hmm. <laughs> yo cuz. She's so. awesome. I know her too. I've run into yeah. her a couple of times and always just, you know, I leave with such good energy, you know, yeah. I'm like, wow, she's just got a really a lot of good energy, you know, yeah. a lot of really good medicine that she carries and seems to bring around. So and she gives the best hugs. So. <laughs> the best hugs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you're in. You're in good company. What's it been like being home? How has it been being home? I mean, I some of the photos that I saw creeping, I'm drawn to food. So I was like, I had to, you know, try not to get too distracted. But I saw a lot of salmon, a lot of, you know, your own traditional foods. So yeah, what's it been like? Being home? It's been it's been really good. Um, it's been really hard, too, at the same time, mm-hmm. because... Um, you know, Vince and I and our family, we had so many ceremonial relatives on the East Coast and 
mm -hmm. Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. So we really had to make a big choice because we had this, um, you know, connection and accessibility to those ceremonies that we knew, like sweat lodge and you know, teepee ceremonies and sun dance and um, different elders um, support there. And coming home, it's it's different. It's a different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a different vibration, which is, you know, not to say it's better or worse, but it's, um, mm -hmm. the ceremonies are different. Um, the beautiful part is when we were able to go into the Gutsi, you know, being a part of witnessing the different potlatch ceremonies and feast ceremonies and bringing our kids and, and having that, that connection is everything. Seeing the masks, seeing the new, you know, initiates, seeing, you know, hearing the stories and all the preparation that people did um, for, for these, um, you know, really important ceremonies uh, to honor their loved ones um, mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So um, that's been really great. Also being back by the ocean has been everything uh, for me. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of uh, healing and peace from the ocean. Um, so we go quite regularly and, and Vince and I, we actually go in the ocean and that's our one of our ceremonies that we have here for our traditional ways is um, spirit baths or ocean baths. And uh, mm -hmm. and so I've reconnected with that um, since being home. And uh, and it, it is like, you know, the same experience that you get from a sweat lodge. You, you're sort of, you come out and you feel um, alive. You feel connected to your spirit again, like you've called it back into yourself. And um, so that has been helpful. Um, just again, like the school, the, the cultural program here, that's such a beautiful, rich hub. Uh, cultural mm -hmm. leaders, um, all of our Kwak 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 people uh, are really resilient and, and powerful with their, you know, you've been here, you met them and their mm -hmm. their songs and their, their voice and their presence. So I'm learning a lot um, and sort of continuing on that that learning journey um, forever and always always going to be <laughs> doing that and I've got a long way to go um, but I think that you know um, it's been good and and also challenging just you know with dealing with other factors like uh, housing because we didn't have a house right when we moved here we had to kind of um, shuffle around a couple of places and and, um, and and so that kind of has been challenging, but uh, we did, we have a house mm -hmm. now and a uh, garden and, and things are really, really Yay. family, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. My next question, and we can, you know, feel free anytime you need to go, we can go. I thought we, you know, just with some of the technical issues, we would go on a little bit longer. But I mean, because you have been a part of so many different cultures and you've been invited into different spaces. And so you grew up with your culture and are familiar with your ways and um, being in the big house and learning about your traditions and teachings. But then you've also been invited and, you know, Sundance ceremony and you've engaged in sweats and all kinds of different indigenous traditions what are some of the commonalities that you've experienced throughout all of the different spaces and cultures that you've been a part of well honestly i didn't grow up very um deeply rooted to our like our potlatch system um because mm -hmm. you know obviously you're aware of the the potlatch ban um, mm -hmm. and how that impacted um, not just potlatch ceremony, all ceremonies, um, mm -hmm. so really uh, impacted Indigenous spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. And so our family, we had a residential school here, we had um, many different aspects that, that sort of um, limited our family's connection until mm -hmm. these sort of recent years in my lifetime where our family hosted our, our first potlatch in 2014, um, mm -hmm. you know, through my, my cousin who's my age, who got a chieftainship and and my uncle. Um, so that was really our, our family's first go at it. And there's a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say a lot, but there's um, several families here who've, you know, kept the traditions alive um, over those challenging times, sort of those dark mm -hmm. ages of um, having to go underground and do things in mm -hmm. secret. And they've kept that alive and it's coming back. Um, so I didn't have a lot of access to that, especially growing up in, in the city and being raised by my father, who's, you know, from mm -hmm. a, sort of a Jewish American background. Um, and uh, so that's where, you know, sort of that um, East Coast experience was um, a longing to, to know and to be connected after leaving mm -hmm. home and just sort of um, learning before going out East, um, learning some, some you know, 
language um, pieces around identifying myself as well as um, some ladies dances and, and some some songs but um, really I, I I started my sort of spiritual journey and everything through connecting to those other ceremonies mm -hmm. I'm just very fortunate to to make those connections. I've been um, very blessed to be welcomed to um, different territories and different lodges, and um, made to made like I was um, one of their own um, in, in mm -hmm. a way. You know, like never feeling like an outsider, always feeling welcome, knowing that I, I come from a different uh, background and lineage. But it, it just comes with how you carry yourself and having um, a good heart and good values and expressing that. So. Um, I was made to feel welcome and I'm so grateful because it really, you know, meant everything for my husband and I and our children and um, the blessings that we had and, and the, the ability to connect in those sacred ceremonies, um, it helped us. And like I said, for the last few years, we had been praying and praying and praying for this life that we now have here back in my home community. So it's, it's really come full circle. And um, mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful to see things unfold and yeah, I'm excited about it. Have there been any in this time? It's been very difficult. This is a very real moment uh, that we're living right now with this global pandemic and everyone is being affected and it's bringing us together just as much as we're being separated and isolated. It's bringing us together as human creatures, you know, as sentient beings uh, on this planet. Have there been any big realizations, big or little realizations for you personally in this time, um, just with the changes that this time has presented? Have there been any kind of learnings or teachings or realizations that you've experienced? I think that it really started um, shifting my perspective. Like Vince has always been mindful of a lot of things, uh, of the, you know, things happening in, in the world. And I've just sort of kept my head down sometimes and just continued working. Um, but things really shifted for me after spending um, a few days at a conference last last spring. Went to Niagara Falls in the territory of the Mississauga New Credit. And um, I was with one of the elders, um, Charlie Patton, at, at, um, who was involved with the program, the work that we we're doing at McGill. And mm -hmm. he really, you know, looked out for me. He had a a really uh, wonderful energy and presence. Yeah, that's him and I at Niagara Falls at IHOP. We had like a hundred dollar pancake <laughs> breakfast. But I love really IHOP. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they charge extra there because oh. of that view. But um, yeah, it was a really transformative time. And, and that breakfast in particular, we talked about different things. And he, he really talked about prophecy with me. And, um, you know, just these things these perspectives of, from you know his his own um, stories and teachings um, being Ganya Kahaga and being a Mohawk um, longhouse faith keeper he really you know um, illuminated some things and I just remember looking across the table at him when he was telling me that you know they say that by 2050 things are going to be very different and sort of described what the prophecy said about how the world was going to be and, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he was you know very upset and um and his his whole um emotion was coming from that his grandchildren wouldn't be okay you know that he mm -hmm. said that i'll be i'll be gone by then but my children and my grandchildren and that was like in his face i could see like that real like okay this is like that that felt like that moment for me and i got home and i remember Vince and I were still kind of on the fence about decisions and moving and what we were going to do. And then I said, you know what, I think it's, time. you're right, we need to get out of the city. We need to go and let's do it. Let's, and he was like, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him what Charlie said and, um, and he was like, okay, yeah, let's do this. And so we really, you know, put the plan in motion and were able to do it. And that was a really critical um, time. So I, you mm -hmm. know, things, things are ever changing and um, out of our control, but definitely it's, uh, I think it's a time, it's a critical time for us as human beings as, and as indigenous people to do our best and to um, really take care of ourselves, our loved ones, and to start setting 
paving the way for our, our future generations to pick up those those pieces and to have that so they, they can be resilient and they can continue to heal and to thrive because you know, I don't believe things are going to end for us um, but you know I think that we need a lot of um, a lot of work we need to do a lot of work to take care of our our people mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that um, is there anything else that you would like to share before we kind of come full circle and bring this conversation to a close anything that's been on your heart or your mind or any work other work that you've been involved in that you want to share any people you want to uplift just i want to leave this space for you to share anything else now um that's a good question um i think i just want to say thank you to my family um to my uh, husband and to my two children um we've really been a, a unit through this whole sort of um quarantine type of life and uh, it's been challenging but we've really worked together and grown a lot as a family and uh, I'm just really grateful for them in my life and um, missing my granny and um, my like I get to see my sister um, but all of our loved ones here all my family uh, who are in the U.S. and um, just looking forward to some of the work ahead with the First Nations Health Authority as well as um, you know, some projects that I have coming um, with uh, an organization called Yoga Outreach. Uh, we're working on a, a curriculum for um, First Nations women, um, sort of an online offering. So that's kind of keeping me busy, um, but just grateful to be home in um, this community and um, release and, and uh, with my people and working with my people and for them. So just mm -hmm. so, yeah. and thank you so much, Emily, for having me and um, you know uplifting me and uh, giving me some space to, to share and to maybe embarrass myself and sing <laughs> on the live stream but thank you really and chatting with you and and uh, witnessing your journey too so really appreciate the time and connection as well hi hi thank you so much and thanks for your patience with some of the technical stuff some of the running around but you know we managed to make it work and I know I speak for many in saying that you truly are an inspiration. Um, you know, just something, one of the positive parts about this whole virtual world and reality is that we get to watch each other, whatever we, little bits and breaths that we do share online, we get to be a part of that and kind of witness, which has always been a part of our people's witnessing and observing and learning through witnessing. And a lot of what you share talking about healing and and moving our bodies and working through things within our bodies and within our minds and what you shared today just sitting sitting in some of the difficult emotions and learning how to come back to breath that breath is ceremony i mean there's i'm just really grateful for this good conversation you know to kind of end off the week and to bring into the weekend and then you know i've mentioned before these conversations i'm working with someone to make highlight videos so we can pull out some of these quotes and really sit with them as well and give them the time and attention that they deserve and and really process and think about what you shared here so i'm very grateful and i'm sure everyone who has participated today is grateful for your time and sharing and i know it's hard being a full-time mom and working and doing your phd and all of that so thank you so much and yeah, I look forward to keeping track with your journey and seeing where you go and what you get involved in and supporting in whatever way. Thank you so much. Great Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.